Let's look and get a few. Cool. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Logan. I'm the treasurer for this wonderful club, and I also work for Ice Age, aka the evil bastards that put on the cyber defense competitions. The point of this is to kind of walk through some of the boxes, uh, kind of explain what was completely foobar about them, how you might have known that, and how you might have gone about unfoobarring. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, please just raise your hand. This is, com this is completely freeform. I have nothing prepared. I'm doing this all off the top of my head. Ask questions. This will go smoother for both of us. Uh, I can also talk about some of the anoms if you want. And I have one, two, three, three other members of Ice Age in the room. So if I mess up, they can yell. Especially these two shady gentlemen in the front that cover <laughs> their heads. Uh, so, does anyone have, first of all, who all competed in the cyber defense competition? Cool. So, like, over half. Does anyone have any, any questions, anything they'd like to start on? Anything that made them especially sad inside? No? Cool. Okay, well then we'll just kind of run down the list box by box. Uh, the first box we're going to talk about is the one I built, aka the Legacy IT Machine. Uh, this one was living on your network from day one. Uh, you guys just couldn't see it in vCenter. Uh, easy way to find it would be just to do a quick ping sweep of your entire range. It would have responded, it was there. Uh, you guys had credentials to log into it. Uh, Jack Danielson, the legacy IT guy. Uh, what was wrong with this box? Everything. Um, I pretty much went through the Windows menus, turned on all of the like optional features and programs and things and stuffs, removed all the security, had fun with the Windows registry. This box was something that should have just burned in, should have been burned to the ground. The point of it was just to give Red Team a nice, easy foothold onto your network, something to pivot off of. This box was also uh, part of an anomaly that dropped at 9 o'clock, where you hired a new person, and this was their machine, because why would you buy a new computer when you hire someone new? Just repurpose an old one. Uh, so how do you secure this? You don't. You just put a big-ass firewall in front of it. Um, I, there were a couple teams that did try to go through and undo all the evil I did in the six hours left of the competition. I don't think it worked well for any of them. Uh, the best way to do this was just all I required was RDP access. It didn't even have to be domain joined or anything. So the right way to secure this was to put it, put it in its own little network box, it's a little DMZ, uh, put RDP through your firewall to that box and nothing else goes in or out of that box. That was the right way to secure it. Um, pretty simple. The, that box wasn't critical to your infrastructure or anything, so uh, you could have also just turned it off and lost all of those usability points, and it would have sucked for your score, but like, it would have been fine. Uh, maybe better than giving Red Team a pivot point? Who knows? Uh, okay. Any questions on that one? No? Cool. I don't expect there to be many questions just going off the vibe of getting here. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the Dub 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 box, the uh, wonderful website. Anyone have any questions about this one to open with? If you're wondering who built it, it's that man in the black, looking very shady. <laughs> He's still the guy in the black, just no longer the black hat. Um, okay. So the first thing you probably would have noticed when you jumped into this box is, if I recall, this box didn't have apt, or apt-get, or ls. All of these commands were just mapped to some nice little things that spat out various friendly messages, like, you don't need this, or this has been removed from your seat. I removed apt and remapped it, it was just gone. Oh, it was just gone? <laughs> yeah. I thought you had it set to a program, or a little script that just wrote out, you don't need this. No. no? Okay. 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 Basically, yeah, you, know, you get that has still give you the message. You don't need this. Yeah, you don't need it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you don't need that. You had don't get. You had curl. You had make git gcc. You had everything you needed to just compile it from source. You also had uh, dpkg, which is what app uses under the hood to actually install packages. So if you didn't want to bother recompiling app, you could just uh, wget something.dev from the Debian repos. 
and then dpkg tack i dev name, and bada bing bada boom, you've installed whatever it is you want. Uh, the more annoying one would be ls, which I think was just completely overwritten with SL. Yes, for those of you who aren't familiar with SL, it's a beautiful program, it stands for Steam Locomotive. Uh, when you type it, it's, uh, it sends a train across your screen. Nice and slow, and it just goes. You can't get out of it. Your terminal's dead for a minute. Uh, easy way to get around this, there are other ways to list the contents of a directory. Uh, you can do it the fun fascism way for f in star echo dollar sign f done. Uh, would be a nice little one-liner bash script to print it out. I think I might. I think I missed a do with it. You guys are cool. Um, there's also some other commands. Uh, dir would have done it. Dir lists out the same contents. Uh, and yeah, there's multiple ways to get around that. Uh, let's see. Obviously, you could have reinstalled that package as well. Uh, how would you know that these packages are forked? I mean, you, you typed it. They said they were forked. Alternatively, you could use uh, debsums, which is a wonderful utility on Debian-based distros, uh, which is more important on some of the other boxes, but in this one it would have helped you find ls and uh, apt-get. Debsums calculates the SHA, or no, the MD5 hash of all of the installed packages, and then compares it to the upstream uh, hash of all the packages, so you can tell which ones have been modified. Very helpful anytime you get a box from questionable people. Uh, run Debsums. It'll make your life easier. It'll tell you what's what's a virus and what's not. Or what, what might be. Let's see. There's also anonymous FTP uploads, so like C99.php. You just want to take over? Because I'm just reading through your list. I don't remember. Oh. Most of the actual evil. Uh, yeah, so pre installed in the box were. Oh, no. Sorry, headphones. Hi, YouTube. No one's probably <laughs> going to watch this. <laughs> Except us. <coughs> yeah, it's probably good. So, uh, out of the box, when you guys got the box, uh, I had a few root shells, web shells on there. Uh, there was one on port 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 that was just a Python one that was already in slash might have been in Well, that's what ran it. The actual Python. Okay, yeah, well, I put it in slash lib because who looks in slash lib? Um, and then there was another uh, shell that was disguised to look and run in a very similar way as a systemd service, although that one didn't work for other reasons. Um, <coughs> yeah, and then an RC local, uh, which is uh, a file that runs stuff at start, that's where the go binary got called and the, uh, the Python script got called as well. So if you had looked at RC local, you would see that there is a Python script being activated upon your boot. And that was fun. Um, yeah, there was an anonymous FTP upload. Uh, it never actually served FTP, and I'm not sure why, but that would have been a great way to get cdn.php, which is a fun PHP web shell. Um, a lot of uh, files that shouldn't have been in local people were, such as Etsy Shadow, Etsy Password, which is a really easy way that we got a lot of your passwords. Um, yeah, and I just went through the install process and just installed basically everything I could. So there was a mail server, there was Postgres, uh, it was an SSH server, it was all sorts of things that did not need to be at all, which was quite fun. Let me know if that's any, if that's it. I think that might have been it. Camera. Is there any way to, like, like a dev sum to find stuff that shouldn't be world readable that is? Uh, there's uh, probably a script out there somewhere that will check those common file firms. I can't think of one off the top of my head. Uh, I would bet money that it exists on GitHub somewhere. Um, that said, you should probably go ahead and assume that anything in Etsy should not be world writable. Um, as far as world readable, use your common sense. Etsy Shadow should not be read by anyone but Root. Uh, yeah. It was really cool. We actually had a guy with a 2070 just grinding away passwords. It was really fun. So, did he use John the Ripper? Did he use another? Hashtag. Sorry, I don't know.
Oh, uh, so Hashcat is very similar to John the Ripper, where uh, I can't re remember the exact parameters, but you feed it the hashes, and then it takes a list of potential passwords or generates a password list of its own um, and compares the hashes. So if I have an MD5 hash of a password, because hashing is a one-way thing, you can't undo a hash, it will hash each pass potential password of this list and compare the two. And if it finds a matching hash, then it will dump the, uh, the uh, password that was associated with that hash, and then you have, of course, the hash required. Um, the nice thing about Hashcat over some of the others is it has GPU support, so you can run it with, like he said, the 2060s. Uh, you can also specify masks. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but the team-specific passwords from Icemore have a very specific format, consonant, vowel, consonant, number, number, consonant, vowel, consonant. That is every TSI password ever. It follows that format, which Red Team likes a lot because then they can put this mask into uh, Hashcat, and then Hashcat says, wow, I can just ignore like 99% of all, pass all possible eight-character passwords. So that's kind of fun, if you guys didn't know that. Uh, there was uh, an anomaly, actually, partway through where you guys got uh, got a password hash in this format, uh, and you guys can try and crack it, uh, just to show how easy Red Team has it. Were there any questions about the dub 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 box? Back to improv hour. Uh, let's see. That was dub dub dub. down on AD Exchange, to my knowledge, this box was more or less unfucked with, other than your updates. Uh, the updates were disabled in like several ways through various Windows registry keys. I don't remember which ones. Uh, moral of the story is anything you can do in Windows, you can probably do three other ways, and there are registry keys for everything. I, if I recall, uh, Alex did not, in fact, collapse the registry tree before he closed, uh, or before he cloned the box. Fun fact about regedit is it will leave open any trees you have open. So if I navigate all the way down the registry tree to the flag that lets me, you know, change the Windows Update server to uh, wasus.cbc.com, which is my evil Windows Update server, uh, and now I don't close that and clone it out, you guys, when you open regedit, you can see that tree. So that's something that's always worth checking. Uh, it's not hard to hide that, but like it requires us remembering to do it. So. Who actually closes the registry tree? Come on, guys. Uh, that, would have, that was the big one there on the AD box. Um, I know a lot of you guys had problems getting the various email services up and running. Uh, part of the problem with that was we shipped you guys to the box with no users made uh, for reasons of we don't know the magic passwords when we deploy them. Um, or we do, but it would be way too much effort to do that for you guys. You guys can make users. Uh, so in order to get email working, you had to not only make the user an active directory, but then make a mailbox in Exchange and map that to that user, which is like very easy uh, if you click through the menus. Otherwise, you can do it my preferred way, which is PowerShell. Uh, if you guys don't know PowerShell, you should really learn it. It's a fantastic tool. Uh, it gets a bad rap compared to like Bash, but it, it's the best way to manage Windows IMO. Uh, other than that, I don't think there was much wrong with your AD boxes. Um, the guy who made it shaking his head, so that's a good sign. That means I'm not totally batshit. Any questions on that one? And what was wrong with it? How to fix it? How to make it not bad? No? Sweet. The next box, and perhaps the most evil of all the boxes, was the SCADA boxes. The three beautiful BSD scale boxes. <laughs> Unfortunately, the evil genius who wrote that code is not here today. Otherwise, he would happily spend two hours explaining to you what he did, how he did it, and why it works. Uh, if you ever get a chance to talk about like systems level stuff with Moody, I recommend it. It's very smart. Uh, a brief overview, though. You had three applications. They're, the code for that was open source. We gave you the link. It's on our GitHub. I think it's ours. It might be. 
It's out on GitHub somewhere. Uh, there was a crane, a security camera device, and a generator. Uh, these three all shared state over NFS, which is a network file system. So they would all mount each other, mount each other's file systems, and then share information via files on those file systems. Really neat. I've never seen a, an application do that, so that was kind of cool. Uh, the, the problems with this box were many. First, uh, NFS. The, way, the magic way your machines were sharing state. Uh, the way it was set up, it did not have any form of authentication whatsoever. So anyone who knew the magical commands to mount an NFS volume could just mount your NFS volumes and then go perusing your entire uh, virtual disks, which is like a fun and easy way to get whatever they want, especially because they could mount as root and then go read Etsy shadow or password or flag that text. Um, the correct way to fix that would have been to put off on that and also upgrade from NFS. I think he said it was V3 and V4 is the newest one. Do that upgrade, that adds a bunch of extra security and bug fixes and fun stuff. Uh, let's see. Oh, that box had three evil binaries. Uh, PKG, which is the uh, BSD version of apt or whatever, uh, password and what? Oh yes, ping. Uh, I forget which one did which. One of them, every time you ran it, would reset your NSF config or NFS configs. So if you changed it to like not allow them to mount your NFS volumes as root, now they can again because you typed. I think that one was ping. You, you or ping was the one that reset your password. Okay, CVC. PKG was the one that reset your uh, NFS configs. Uh, pings, reset your root password to CDC. That's fun, right? Who doesn't like that? Uh, password had this fun thing. If you entered the password correctly the first time, so you guys are all familiar with password PASSWD, resets Linux passwords. You type in a password, and you type it again, and the password says, good job. You can type good, that's the new password. The way he set this up, is if you typed it correctly the first time, it would, I think it said it changed it and then just didn't. Uh, and then just exited with a ret val of zero, so you're like, hey, I changed my root password. And then you tell your team, and then your team tries to log in, and they're like, you didn't change this root password. I saw this happen several times, it was quite hilarious. Uh, so the, the way it would work is uh, to, Typo the first time, so you like you type CDC, enter, and then a different password, and then it'll say, sorry, you got done fucked up, here's another try. That one would actually reset the password if you put it in correctly. <coughs> it's a security measure, so you can't change the passwords, you know. Uh, ways to get around this is uh, similarly to dem sums on uh, Ubuntu Debian things. Uh, calculate the sums of your packages. I don't know if there's a BSD tool for it. There might be. If not, write a script. It's not hard. Uh, do your check your SHA sums, and then if it's wrong, reinstall it. Um, I think the best way I saw to get around the uh, the password one was uh, someone went on a different machine on a different BSD machine, set the password. Uh, like made a password, copied that hash onto their machine <laughs> into Etsy Shadow. I mean, it changed their password. I've just never seen someone copy a, a hash from one shadow file to another, so that was kind of neat. Uh, you they also would have had to uh, remove the immutable bit. Uh, Moody had a lot of fun with the extra different file descriptor bits you can set. Uh, chatter is a fun command. Is it not chatter on BSD? BSD is something else. Okay. Shows huge flags. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So it's like different commands, same thing. Uh, just set immutable bits on stuff uh, so that you can't like edit it or delete it or anything. You had a lot of fun with that. Was there no salting on the passwords then? If you could just copy and paste. The salt is stored in the password hash. So oh, a password hash has the format dollar sign. Uh, one through six, six being the current, 
this tells you how the password is encrypted. Uh, I, don't know, I think it's I'm pretty sure it's salt and then a dollar sign. Yeah, and then Marker is garbage and my handwriting isn't much better, so I apologize. Yeah. Okay. I grabbed my So you have dollar sign, number for the hash version, again, six is the most common. I believe it's uh, salt next, and then a dollar sign, and then your hash. Basically, the hash is stored, or the salt is stored next to the hash because the salt is unique for each password as well. The salt is randomly generated uh, when you set the password. So theoretically, it might be the same for two users, but like the odds of that are very low. I think it's eight characters usually. Um, and that's just randomly assigned by the system. And what they do is you take your password, and you append your salt, and then you just hash that and that gives you a magical, cryptographically secure thing. And then to do this, to check this again, to check your password, they take what you put in as a password, again, append the same salt, just read out of this file, hash it, see if it matches. So uh, it's a great way to, you know, securely store passwords and authenticate people without ever having the password stored in places. This will be relevant again when we talk about another box. So, any other questions on the BSD stuff? I will do my best to explain it. So you did something to like uh, BIM and uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. and everything else. Oh! There's actually kind of an interesting way around it that, because uh, uh, I, I think I, I surprised Jacob with it when I, when I uh, FreeBSD has a built-in editor called EE, and that was available to you. So you still could edit stuff. So, <laughs> it's, it's super obscure. You have to. I have to look it up on the. If you're not familiar with the history of Linux and stuff, computers used to function over teletypes, which were basically printers. Uh, it would print out a line of text on a piece of paper, print it, like move it off a line, uh, typewriter style, and that was how you interface with your computer. Ed was the OG text editor, uh, and it works on that same principle. Uh, Vim, VI, Nano, those are all buffered, meaning you see a chunk of your file up to 80 lines on a normal terminal, uh, and you can scroll up and down on it. That's called buffering. That would not be possible on an old school teletype because you'd have to print out the entire thing. And if I click the down arrow to go down a line, I'd have to print out 80 more lines. That's just dumb. Why would you do that? Uh, Ed is the OG editor. It edits in place. Uh, the syntax we're using it's a little weird and wonky, and I've never bothered to learn it. Uh, but it comes on, I think, most distros. Um, VI, Vim, Nano, Gedit, whatever else you prefer. Uh, these are all things that came later. You don't, strictly speaking, need them. So he did much the same thing as when you don't need app, he just made those go away and left you edit because that's the default editor. Ask him about Ed, he'll talk to you about that too. <laughs> And on. Yes. We only need that. Yes, you could theoretically edit all your files with the magic of said awk and cat. Please don't. Mm -hmm. You just need a you just okay. uh, what? E D E. Well it was E E. Oh E E? Yeah, echo and echo. Yeah, it's oh, okay. very specific so he, to free BSD. Yeah. He helped you out give you something a little nicer, I guess? Sorry, I just heard of how you said ED. I, I found it, I found it by looking up like free BSD stuff. He didn't know it was there. Yeah, yeah. yeah we were a little bit. Huh. All right. Ed, Ed should work. He gets it's not installed on the why would you ever want to use it? That's I, don't know. I just wanted to see what yeah, it was. Yeah, EE has been about that. Value. Like, oh, that's, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. Okay. So that's the skate shit. As long as no one has any other questions. Uh, oh, the time card. We haven't touched that yet. Mm -hmm. You built that one. Oh, Alex. Alex, you built that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this one had some evil on it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I remember some of these now. 
Okay, this was C Sharp running on server 2008. Yep. Uh, this is the other Windows box Alex made. He was much less kind to you on this one. Uh, you want to talk about it or you want me to run through it? I don't really care. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, let's see. Starting with uh, some fun machine mans. Uh, Utilman was replaced with CMD. Uh, which one is Utilman? Like the accessibility one? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar, we like to do sticky keys with CMD. So you just hit shift five times and you get a command prompt. And if you do that while you're not logged in, you get uh, a fun NT authority system command prompt because you're, it's actually trying to fire off an accessibility tool and which runs a system and instead you're getting command line because we put that binary there. He's done the same thing here. Uh, just with a different one of the accessibility tools. Rather than sticky keys, it's the actual accessibility tools. Again, if you're not logged in, maybe even if you are logged in, it runs a system, so you just get that wonderful anti-authority system shell, which is like root on Linux. Uh, let's see. Projects folder is shared with anyone. Uh, the Windows equivalent of chmod777. Auto-admin login, so if you left a uh, terminal, or a, uh, not terminal, uh, console open on vCenter. Uh, you just got admin. It's like, okay, thanks. I didn't want to type in my password anyways. Uh, whoop, disabled? Is that the Windows update? Yep. Backend daemon? Yeah, so not only were updates disabled, but the actual daemon that runs in the background that like checks for updates and does updating things, that was gone. Well, it wasn't like, gone, it just disabled. Just and turned off. From yeah. Next to me. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyone can RDP in. Tons of local GPO again. If you're not familiar with your policy, is the magical way you manage Windows servers in a domain. You can have local group policy, or you can have domain group policy, or you can have forest group policy, or you can have subdomain group. Group policy is great. Uh, you can also do a lot of evil things with it by just configuring things in really dumb ways. You said anyone can RDP in? Yeah. Huh. Yep. <laughs> I, I couldn't figure out how to get anyone to RDP <laughs> So, uh, my guess is that at some point in time, while trying to figure it out, I changed something that caused that to happen. So, but yeah. The menu right. for who can RDP in is not actually terribly hidden, uh, and you're supposed to use it as a whitelist and just like, yeah, Tom can log in, and Bob can log in, and Joe can log in, but you can also just say, uh, anyone in the users category can just log on in. RDP is nice. Uh, Windows is nice. They love to let you just allow anyone to do anything. It's fun. Uh, yeah. Uh, as far as why you had troubles, I have no idea. Uh, ooh, it says here that application logs were disabled. Well, it didn't log in in the first place, so... Oh, you put that in the machine section, so I thought you meant you disabled the system logs, oh. which would be far more evil. Well, not that much. Windows logs would be useless, but... Uh, no local firewall. Ooh! Uh, so, you know this, right? Password hashing? Oh, the point of a hash is that it's a one-way function. Like, you, you put in a password, and you get a magic number out, and you can't go from that magic number back. If you want to know why, I take... 331, 431, or 531. Those are their crypto classes. Uh, this box had reversible encryption going on. So rather than H of stuff, we had E of stuff. Which, E here is a, an encryption function, the difference being that encryption is a reversible process. So if you happen to get the magical key or guess it, you can go backwards. So if they lifted the encryption key off of your Windows system, uh, I think you can get that with memdump. Uh, then they could just reverse that encryption process and get the plain text passwords. Nice and easy, uh, especially if anyone can log in and if they have local admin, then they can dump system memory. It's a good time. Uh, let's see. Oh, and he, uh, Windows has a built-in FTP server, Windows Server does, that you can just go turn on with the click of one little checkbox. It's very nice. Uh, and then you can set the root directory. And in this case, he set www.root as the uh, root directory, aka where your website lives. So if there were, I don't know, a flag in, say, your time card file, uh, you could just FTP get hours.xml and bada bing bada boom, have a flag. Red Team loves easy flags. 
onto the actual application that was running on that box, a, what was it, .NET 4.0 C Sharp app? Yeah. Yep. That, that time card app was uh, fun. Uh, kind of hard-coded uh, manager, I think was the username. Yeah. Hard-coded login, so you could just log in as manager CDC, presumably. Secret. But see, okay, uh, manager secret. But again, uh, probably didn't take Red Team too long to find that. Uh, not that they needed it, because ours.xml was not behind uh, anything that would like say throw a 403 by default, meaning that all you had to do was uh, send a nice request to timecard.team and icc.com slash ours.xml. And bada bing bada boom, again, easy ours.xml, uh, which had a flag in it. Uh, only the home page had off, kind of like I said, so any sub page down, further down the tree uh, would not get the 403s that you would expect. Uh, state was stored in a plain cookie on your browser, so you could just go in and say, I'm an admin now. And the app would say, well, your cookie says you're an admin. Sure. Uh, you can get to your cookies either with an extension or just uh, if you open up the developer console on major browsers, uh, you can just go ahead and edit your cookies in that. Very helpful. Uh, it says here, everything except for the login is done over GET requests. That's kind of neat. Hmm. Why didn't you do GET over, or login over GET? Come on now, um, query strings. Because .NET doesn't like that. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, are there any questions on that box? No. Sweet guys are like, so into this, I love it. <laughs> Let's see, are there any that I missed? Just go take a quick peek over here. I don't think so. I think that's all of them. Does anyone have any questions about any of these? Any questions about any of the anomalies we did? Any, anything? This is your time to ask me questions, no matter how dumb they are, unless your name is Jack. What's up? So I know on previous years they had like a, a red team document that they gave the blue teams for each individual ones, or were we talking about that, or is Ah, that yes. Uh, <coughs> uh, okay. Hey Cole. Yes. Come here. Did you log I do need you to log in as your blue account, because if I log in as my admin account, it won't be where it should be. That's my bad. Uh, hey, look, now everyone can go look at the Red Wiki. Uh, this is where Red Team keeps their notes as they are poning all of your shite. Uh, what do we have in here? I didn't even look. A lot team 8 leaked some hashes. That's kind of neat. A lot of impacted. There was a lot of impacted stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, Red Team had a lot of fun with 
the, the Windows stuff. Do, do, do. Oh, e Roni with the password E. Ooh, like a lot of teams. Yeah, so Need also up. audit your guys' users, because there were a lot of users on the machines, like username CDC, password CDC. Mm -hmm. uh, e Yee. Things like that, where they obviously aren't in a scenario that we be anywhere, and they're just kind of living there. Probably with web level access, so just audit what's on your box. As a general rule, we will always give you the full list of all of your users. Um, usually, like we just give you that spreadsheet that you're used to seeing with eight to maybe 20 users tops. Uh, if we ever do more than that, uh, in the past I've shipped, I want to say 5,000 is my current record for number of users. Um, if we ship that many, we'll always give them to you in like a JSON or a CSV or something, something scriptable uh, rather than you know a spreadsheet. Um, because sometimes we just want you to simulate having thousands of users. Why not? Uh, more hashes in here. Ooh, Team, o, team 5 had some, some leaks, it looks like. Or Team 5 here? I'm sorry, guys. Ooh, someone found a private key, it looks like. Yeah, so you can, you can look through all this on your own. Um, you can also go over here and look. Oh, they didn't use it. Sad. Um, what? Oh, okay. Excuse, oh, they uploaded some files. Ooh, dub 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 source. That's kind of fun. Uh, oops, not that one. Oh, yeah, it didn't get used. That's sad. This is a fun tool Red Team has to keep track of any and all vulnerabilities that they want to. Um, this one here is my personal favorite. Uh, AW's leaked credit. Any of you recognize the username AW? Uh, what? The Portman Sun. Yeah, he got fired. And when he got fired, he got mad. And so he leaked passwords. Like, Team One's password was uh, SOP69BOL. Uh, here's the rest of the teams. Ooh, Scrat has this. Uh, yeah. So, as far as how you can see Red Team stuff, that's how. My bad. I apologize. Uh, anything else? Yeah, so um, there's like DebSums command for like Linux and stuff. Is there an equivalent for Windows? Off the top of your head? Not that I'm aware of. That's okay. Have yeah, Windows doesn't have packages. Um, as far as checking the integrity of like the built-in Sys32 stuff, no idea. Um, there might be shots from Windows. Those some. might be published, but I wouldn't bank on it. Uh, a better guess is just knowing that most of the stuff in System32 uh, breaks the OS if it changes. Uh, Easy way to check is just start with the accessibility tools, the sticky keys, stuff like that. Uh, because sticky keys is like the uh, recommended way to reset a root password, or sorry, administrator password if you lose it. Uh, you just remount the file system on like a Linux box or something, and then move that binary over, and then plug it back in, boot from that, and then you can sticky keys to change your root password. Uh, that's like the recommended way to do it. Whatever. Um, so I, I guess you just start double clicking things in system 32 or whatever. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> so you go file by file. Then you can start. Yeah. Yeah. Does CMD actually open CMD? Does sticky keys actually open CMD? Right. So things like that, yeah, you could just check. Um, don't like try to run <coughs> random ass DLLs without an idea of what they're doing. It's not a great idea. But that's great. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to Wacker unless you have Snapchat. <coughs> uh, don't try to rename your domain controller's host name. Just <coughs> <on the> <laughs> links. <laughs> so, anything else? Going once. Going twice. Sweet. I get to stop talking.